Martin Luther King Jr. once said, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. And in a society marred by violence, hatred, and a lack of preventative action, it's essential to do just as he said, considering that over 10 million women and men in the United States are subject to domestic violence each year, it's imperative to take the first step up the staircase to enacting legislative initiatives and victim-based change to truly make a difference. But before I begin my presentation, I would like to introduce myself and share my passion for this research. My name is Anya Venkat, and I'm a senior at Arizona College Prep High School in Phoenix, Arizona, and my mentor for this project is Roddy Damis. Last year, I led a hygiene product drive alongside my group that collected over $40,000 worth of items for local domestic violence shelters across the state. Seeing the implications of violence firsthand has compelled me to take an interest in preventative measures that can help me give back to the community. After high school, I plan to study political science and public policy at college before attending law school. Here are some of the topics I want to touch on in my presentation today. First, I will go over an introduction to my research, discuss domestic violence legislation, analyze emergency restraining orders, and conclude with personal recommendations, expanding on the significance of this project. But let's begin with some introductions and key terms. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in four women and one in seven men have experienced physical intimate partner violence during their lifetimes. But despite this alarming statistic, legislative initiatives that actively prevent the problem while addressing systemic issues are yet to be seen. In terms of action, however, steps have been taken to address DV by grassroots organizations, individuals, as well as legislation. Thankfully, one particular attempt at preventing DV is beginning to gain traction among several states. The concept of emergency restraining orders these restraining orders restrict a perpetrator of domestic violence from purchasing a firearm following their conviction, and these measures have been reconsidered following the consequential Supreme Court case, United States v. Rahimi, which will be explained in detail later in this presentation. Mr. Rahimi challenged a state-level ruling prohibiting his firearm access using the Second Amendment, stating that he had a right to own a gun as a citizen of the United States. With both the arguments over constitutionality and social improvements in mind, national leaders should begin furthering critically needed legislative change in order to prevent future domestic violence and provide aid to those already impacted by abuse. But next, let's analyze legislative initiatives as well as their systemic and implementation issues. Some of the past legislation targeted at addressing DV included the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, or the FVPSA, the Domestic Violence Prevention Act, and the Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA. Now, FVPSA was introduced to the Senate in 1984, and it provided shelters for domestic violence victims, as well as supports local initiatives that are dedicated to raising awareness about the issue. Meanwhile, the Domestic Violence Prevention Act assisted states in their individual initiatives, as well as supported building shelters for women and children. Notice how male victims have been left out. And finally, VAWA was a bipartisan initiative that provided significant funding to support victim protection, crisis centers, immigrant women protection, and equal justice programs for women in courts. However, these initiatives did come with their systemic issues. Specifically, the term domestic violence itself has become gendered. People rarely believe that men can be considered victims of violence, and most legislative initiatives have not helped male victims. Similarly, teen dating violence is also an issue that's gone under-addressed. According to a report from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 1 in 12 teens have experienced either physical or sexual dating violence. And despite this, 22 out of 50 states do not mandate education about teen dating violence in schools. And this in turn causes teens to feel undersupported, and it also reduces the number of teen victims who actually reach out for help. And finally, laws that separate children from abusive households often do so based on racial stereotypes. Racial stereotypes have caused children to be mistakenly separated from their families, and legislation has not been able to prevent false separations 
signaling another major shortcoming. However, there are also current measures that have been taken and have been somewhat successful in addressing the gaps of these former legislation. For example, the VAWA Reauthorization Act of 2022 expanded funding to also include tribal and Native American communities, increased inclusivity, and finally addressed cyber crimes and online harassment. And the National Domestic Violence Prevention Action Plan also worked with both tribes and states, included the reach of a national hotline, as well as established more services and shelters for the victims of violence. Moreover, several grassroots organizations have been incredibly successful in spreading awareness and offering victim support. Monavi is a U.S.-based organization dedicated to eradicating gender-based violence against women in the South Asian community. Similarly, Insight focuses on preventing violence against women of color. And finally, Bloom 365 is a local grassroots organization in my home state of Arizona that's dedicated to breaking the stigma and spreading awareness about DV, intimate partner violence, and teen dating violence to men and women. These organizations have taken tremendous steps towards preventing future violence and providing aid to the current victims. But despite these steps taken to addressing violence, there are still implementation issues with current initiatives. The Beacon of Hope Crisis Center reported that 75% of domestic violence is unreported and 70% have a dismissal rate, meaning that even though people are reaching out for help, the justice system isn't always on their side. But next, let's analyze the concept of emergency restraining orders, or EROs. Title 18 in the Supreme Court regards the possession or disposal of firearms by a person who is subject of domestic violence protection orders, and the Supreme Court case, U.S. v. Rahimi, concerns the principles of this law. If DV abusers are denied access to firearms, is it a violation of the Second Amendment? Now, prior to his conviction, Mr. Zaki Rahimi partook in numerous incidents involving violence, including shootings and a hit and run, and he was also under a civil protection order from his former partner. And this order included blocking his access to firearms, bringing forth the questions about constitutionality. But there are other circumstances that prohibit individuals from obtaining a firearm, especially following the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. Those who have been convicted of a federal crime with an imprisonment of over one year or a state crime classified as a misdemeanor with over two years of imprisonment may also have their access to firearms blocked. The outcome of this Supreme Court case has major implications on the future of DV legislation, as well as the protections that victims of violence have against their abusers. Boyfriend loophole is a specific terminology that's used to determine, describe the loophole in legislation that's allowing abusive partners to continue their ownership of firearms, posing a threat to others, and the potential lack of legislation preventing those subject to protection orders from using guns is concerning as it deteriorates any protections offered to victims. But finally, let's look over some recommendations that I have considering both federal and individual platforms. Now, on June 21st of this year, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that an individual posing a credible threat to an intimate partner and having an ERO may not possess firearms as consistent with the Second Amendment. And this ruling is monumental to both the justice system and victims of DV. This will help to substantially reduce the number of deaths related to firearm-related DV or abuse. But this isn't the end of the road. In order to truly offer protection to victims, our country must ensure that we're eradicating gender-based disparities by providing hotlines and shelters to male victims, spreading more awareness about teen dating violence, and eliminating the racial stereotypes that are present in separating children from their homes. And ultimately, government agencies should establish more services because protection ensures future advocacy. And this isn't just an issue that affects one demographic, but rather it's something that applies to our whole population and it must be stopped. But thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present at the Polygen Symposium of Rising Scholars. And thank you for listening to my presentation.